the purpose of today's webinar uh, is to focus on a very important aspect of your business. It's to focus on the document, this lease document that we're expected to sign at the beginning of our career or at some point in our career and the implications of that agreement. Um, the, the real focus of today's webinar is how to renegotiate the terms and rental rates in your medical office lease agreement. Uh, my name is Jazz Banga. I'll be today's lecturer. I'm one of the senior consultants here at Sears Consulting Group um, where, 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 where we essentially provide guidance and education for doctors across the country on really to, to ensure that their lease agreement is properly structured to protect their long-term interest in the space. So just to give you a bit of background and, and an idea of who we are and what exactly we do, um, we're, we're essentially a group that was founded by a group of dentists and a group of doctors back in 1994 to ensure that medical health practitioners like yourself are aware of the various challenges that are involved when running a business. Um, on, on an annualized basis, we speak with over 1,000 doctors in reviewing their lease agreements uh, many of which become clients of ours, to ensure that the lease is well structured, uh, we're mitigating any risk liabilities, and that they're aware of the various obligations and commitments they have when they sign that very important lease document. Um, over the course of any given year, we would negotiate 500 medical leases uh, across the country, and that also includes healthcare practitioners like yourself, as well as veterinarians, as, and in, in addition to dentists. Um, who, who have very similar and common challenges that, as a healthcare practitioner, many of you face on a daily basis. Um, since our inception as a group uh, back in 1994, we've negotiated over 10,000 lease agreements across the country. And in many cities and states, provinces, we have built great relationships with the landlord community uh, because, for one, we're providing very valuable tenants for them as a landlord um, to have as a tenant in their building. And one thing that makes healthcare practitioners a great tenant, and in some cases the most ideal tenant, is the fact that we're long-standing tenants. Uh, very, very often we stay in the same location for many years, and we service that local community. Um, so the location that we are set for our business is very important to the growth and, and greater aspects of the business. Um, in addition to the various doctors that we advise and negotiate on behalf of, we also put over 150 seminars similar to today. Um, some, of course, are in person where we provide lectures and CE courses to educate doctors on this fundamentally important document that, quite frankly, many of you have very little experience in understanding, and many of you obviously don't have a legal background, so we provide guidance and to ensure that you are aware of exactly what you're committing to. Um, so we, we, we spend time in, in various markets uh, and many of the uh, trade shows, conferences, to provide these educational lectures, um, of course, to ensure that you as a practitioner are aware of exactly what you're signing. Um, and, and many of you may recognize that, you know, across the United States as well as Canada, we have various clients, colleagues like yourself that are oftentimes are at the whim of the landlord or in an in a inferior position because we're up against professional landlords who work on lease agreements every day. And this is not an area that we, as a, as a practitioner, have great experience in. And very often, if we don't conduct our due diligence appropriately, then in circumstances like that, we can be at disadvantage when it comes to the long-term outlook of the practice. Um, again, these are some of the colleagues that we've worked with uh, across the United States. In addition, we work with clients all over the country, uh, from province to province, uh, whether that's all, all the way on the West Coast from British Columbia, um, you know, all the way to Ontario, Quebec. Very familiar with the billing models and how a practice operates and how the lease agreement has implications on our ability to transition and eventually sell the business. Um, up until recently, many healthcare practitioners would simply walk away from the practice when they were ready to retire and transition um, from being a doctor. Um, that, that landscape has changed significantly uh, over the last few years where there is value associated with, you know, for example, in Ontario, having a full practice and the lucrative nature of having a turnkey practice and deriving some value through a sale of the business. 
in most lease agreements and commercial tenancy agreements, there is language that impacts or provides us with guidance on how we can go through the process of assigning or transferring that lease agreement. So part of this, today's discussion will not only be on the rent rates and some of the additional costs that we pay as a tenant, but also focused on the various legal provisions. And I'll go through various examples of legal legally found in a lease agreement and how we can redraft that to our benefit and to have a mutual, mutually beneficial tenancy and landlord relationship um, when we sign our lease agreement or extend our lease agreement or relocate the practice. Um, really depending on what we're looking to achieve, there's various strategies that we can implement in place to ensure that we get the best result not only for our own tenancy but also for a potential buyer of our business. So the purpose of today's webinar is to discuss the importance of the medical office lead. Uh, again, it's the foundation of our business. It's the only document that governs our relationship between us as a tenant and the landlord themselves. And we must perceive the landlord in some form as a supplier. They're supplying us our space, and in return we're paying them a monthly rent uh, in addition to the triple net costs or tax and maintenance insurance, which are additional costs that are on top of our base rental rate. We'll also discuss the key components that will help you grow, protect, and eventually sell the practice. So how do we determine the practice valuation? What components are evaluated and contribute towards the overall valuation of our business? What terms can we incorporate into the lease or amendments to the lease agreement to protect our long-standing tenancy and to ensure that we remain as a tenant in that space for the amount of time that we commit for? and having a transition plan in place, um, whether we're looking to sell or relocate the business. Uh, facility, facilitating a transfer of the lease agreement is very important and highly contingent on the way that the legal language in the lease agreement uh, is structured. And then I'll also give you some practical tips on how to actually implement and negotiate a lease agreement, whether that is from a negotiation of the rental rates or whether that's on negotiations of the various legal components that are involved in that 60, 80, or 90 page document that we're forced to sign at the beginning of our career. The first question I'd like to ask all of you in today's seminar is, what is the lease agreement? What is this document that is put in front of us, and, and what does it mean? What is the first thing that pops into your head? And when I ask this question all across the country when I'm speaking at various lectures, you know, I oftentimes get very different answers from doctors that are in different parts of their career. Um, many doctors believe it's an obligation, it's a commitment, it's a document binding the relationship between the two parties. And in a nutshell, in, the, in a true reality, what a lease agreement is, it is simply a check. It is one of the biggest commitments that we make as a practitioner in our entire career and one of the largest costs associated with running a healthcare practice is that rental check that we pay every month and every year. In most cases, doctors sign a 10-year lease with two five-year options, where we're committing to 20 years of tenancy and 20 years of rent. And if we aggregate all that rental rate between that 20 years, we're looking at a very significant commitment to the landlord. And in exchange for this monetary commitment, what are we provided? We are provided a space. We're provided a home for our practice. But it's also important that we structure in that lease agreement how that relationship will unfold through its entire career, as well as what options we have going forward when we get to the later stages of our, our lease agreement and we're looking to renew that document. So why is this document so important? For one, it provides us with long-term stability and security. So what that means is when we sign a 10-year lease agreement, it provides us with predictable term where we're guaranteed to be in the space um, and, and provides us with the ability to ensure that we won't be evicted or we'll lose our tenancy and, and our practice home will remain intact. So very important to have a term on the lease agreement. Um, and it's also particularly relevant when we look to sell the business because once we get the practice evaluated, in order for most banks to provide financing for any potential buyer of our business, there typically needs to be a minimum of five to ten years of term in order for the banks to amortize that loan across. 
So again, long-term stability for us, security for us as a tenant, uh, to ensure that you know, at, at, at the landlord's whim, we're not put on the street. Very important that we have this structured in the lease agreement and that there's predictable term and, and time within the lease agreement. We also want to minimize our risk and exposure through the lease agreement. Very often when I speak with doctors, and I encourage you to all check in your lease agreement, that most doctors sign their lease agreement personally. They provide some form of a personal covenant by signing the lease agreement through their personal name. What that does is it provides the landlord with recourse in the event of a dispute between landlord and tenant to come after us personally uh, as a tenant. Not the ideal liability position to be in. And one of the things that we encourage all of our doctors to do when they're structuring their lease agreement is to sign the lease under their corporate entity um, or, or whatever corporate structure they have decided to go on, whether that's a PC, an S Corp, an LLC. It provides some veil of protection, and as we grow further and further into our career, very important that we begin to shield our personal assets and separate our, our personal assets from our business assets. Um, and many times we leave ourselves exposed when we provide that personal covenant. So I'll, I'll go through various examples today of how we can minimize our risk and exposure via the lease agreement to protect our long-term interests. But again, one thing that I will recommend if you haven't already is to have a discussion with your CPA or advisors in terms of the best corporate structure to sign a lease agreement with and, and to ensure that we limit our personal liability. We also want to ensure that we maximize our flexibility. Uh, what that means is, it, is having ample term in the lease agreement and having the ability via the lease agreement to assign or transfer the lease when we are ready to facilitate a transition out of uh, our, our physician position. Uh, very important that we have these flexibilities built into the lease agreement, that assignment language is very clearly drawn out, but there are also other forms of flexibility that we can add to the lease agreement that I'd like to touch base on, uh, such as a death and disability provision, um, which essentially allows us to protect our, our estate in the event of a death or disability. Uh, for example, if God forbid something had occurred to us when we left the practice and we were no longer able to protect, for practice as, as a doctor, then there would be some form of a protection or a flexibility in the lease agreement for us to transfer the lease to our estate, who then in turn would be able to terminate the lease and not be obligated to pay a monthly rent rate. Um, so very important that we have that structure into the lease agreement, and I'll elaborate on that as we um, go forward in the, lease, in the, in the webinar today. Uh, the, other, the other important aspect of the lease agreement is to ensure that we have fair and affordable financial terms. Um, not only do we have predictable rent rates today, tomorrow, but also predictable rent rates that are option periods when we look to extend the lease agreement further down our career. Um, part, part of our group and, and what we offer for our clients is a rent rate analysis or a consolidated rent rate report. Uh, we work very closely with a group called CoStar, and we license proprietary software from them to obtain rental data and comparable rental rates at any given postal code or zip code uh, in the country, whether that be Canada or the United States, to ensure that the rental rates that you are paying are fair and in line with the market. It certainly has an impact on our cash flow and the overhead that we expend spend on a monthly and annual basis. Uh, part of our business valuation is predicated on our rental rates. So it's important that we have fair and affordable rental rates structured into the lease agreement uh, for our career, as well as for any potential buyer of our business. Um, any potential suitor that's looking to acquire business when you're looking to transition would, would like to ensure that their rental rates are in line with the market. So very important that we have that structured into into our lease agreement what escalations will look like. Typically when we look at affordable rental rates, in most cases rent rates go up year over year. Ideally we would like to structure a flat rent rate over the course of the five or ten year lease that you look to sign. But in many cases with the growing of the economy, landlords typically align the escalations based on the economy. Um, in most cases, those escalations are based on a 3% year-over-year increase, which is completely fair and reasonable 
as long as the base rental rates at the beginning of the lease agreement are in line with the market and not out of line. Uh, another way that we can ensure we have fair economics is to ensure that the, esca the, the additional costs that we pay on a monthly basis are true and accurate. So for most of you, when you sign a lease agreement, you're signing a triple net lease. And what a triple net lease, it encapsulates the additional costs that the landlord incurs to either maintain, insure, or for the taxes on the property. Um, many years ago, landlords decided that they would pass through any of these additional costs to their tenants and that it was completely fair and reasonable for them to have you not only pay your base rental rates to let the space, but to also pay any additional costs. Um, what we have noticed from our experience is that in many, rental, in many cases when rent rates are already structured and the base rents are already identified in the lease agreement, landlords will use the triple net cost that taxes maintenance insurance to levy it as a profit center. And what I mean by that is because the additional costs aren't defined, we typically get an estimate from the prior year as to what our additional costs may be for the practice. So that includes things like general upkeep, supplies, management, property, um, repairs, maintenance of the property, any general upkeep of, of the facility would be passed through to us as a tenant. And what, may, what occurs is it's based on previous assumptions of what the past tenants in the previous years paid for those maintenance costs. In a country like Canada where we are a true four season country, you know, the, the additional costs for things like you know, heating, AC, snow removal, they're unpredictable and year over year may change. Um, in many cases, we'll see something like snow removal be an additional cost depending on how often snow needs to be removed. So predictions from previous years would have no bearing on what we should be paying on additional costs. In many cases, when we receive that statement at the end of the year, the landlord may say, hey, by the way, you owe an additional $2,000 because we grossly underestimated what the snow removal cost would be for the maintenance of the property. And at the end of the year, we may be obligated to pay additional costs. What we can do to circumvent that issue and to ensure that the landlord is true and is completely honest with what they're levying to us as a tenant is to include reconcilia reconciliation statement rights and audit rights. So rather than just receiving a one-page or two-page document that states what the landlord spent on, it would be in our interest to receive a detailed and itemized reconciliation statement with a breakdown of day-to-day -day expenses for maintaining and the general upkeep of the property. Um, it, it certainly ensures that we have fair and affordable financial terms um, as we go forward because it keeps the landlord honest. It ensures that what the landlord is truly paying for the upkeep of the property would be transitioned to us on a prorated basis and that we are completely reasonable and it's completely in line with what they truly spent. Um, we also have the ability to have our auditor come in and verify those statements if we believe that there is a discrepancy. And once we have those rights incorporated into the lease agreement, it, it ensures that the landlord is, is completely true and accurate and keeps them credible with their accuracy of statements. So very important not only for our base rental rates to be in line with the market, but any additional costs um, we do receive statements in reference to what is truly being spent. And then, of course, the lease agreement does have broad implications on whether we're able to transition and ultimately sell the business. And the value associated with the practice itself is highly contingent on our ability to transfer that. Um, I, I will speak in great detail on the assignment language and we'll run you through an example of often found language in a lease agreement and some of the challenges with that language and how we can address um, th that drafted amendment in the lease agreement to protect our interest. So how is a practice evaluated? A practice is evaluated on, on three major factors, uh, one being the equipment, number two being the patient, number three being the lease agreement. So we would take the depreciated value of the equipment. Uh, for medical practitioners, 
Um, equipment is not one of the most significant costs that we incur, but there is value associated with the type of equipment we have in the space. If you are looking to transition in the next five to 10 years, I certainly do recommend investing into new technology and equipment to ensure that any potential associate that's looking to buy your practice can do so and, and it will be a modern practice. Um, the second contingent factor is a goodwill. Um, many cases in the type of business we're in, patients are loyal to us and are, are very often come to our office because of who we are and the, and the service that we've provided for the many years. Um, part of what I recommend as well is if we're ever looking to sell the business to remain on throughout the transition phase for a period of six, to, six months to one year when we sell the business so that the new doctor who acquired your business becomes familiar with your clients and it's a smooth transition from party one to party two. One of the most important underlying factors under the foundation of the business is the lease agreement and our ability to transition or ultimately sell the business via the lease agreement by going through an assignment process or transfer of the lease agreement will have great bearing on the value of the business. If we're unable to transfer the lease, very often there's very little value associated with the business. Um, having a well-structured lease agreement with properly addressed and languaged assignment language is very critical to the overall value of our business. So there's four concepts I'd like to discuss that pertain to the lease agreement. Um, number one being the economics of the deal. So these are our rents, these are our escalations year over year, as well as our triple net charges. So again, you know, we want to ensure when we work with a group like CoStar and we receive those market rental rate reports that it is in line with your, with your practice. And one of the things that we can, if you would like to follow up with me following the seminar, um, I can certainly provide you with a rent rate analysis to see where you are in line with the market, whether you're overpaying or underpaying in rent. Uh, in most cases, when I speak with physicians, they're quite often overpaying in rent because most landlords have realized that most physicians are business students or have very little business history. And as a result, take advantage of them when it comes to negotiating the economics of the deal. Um, another important concept, again, is the escalations, year-over-year -year increase in rent rates. What do they look like? Uh, typically, we like to see that about 3% year-over-year. Um, ideally, it would be a flat rental rate. Most landlords will not provide that. But of course, we want to ensure that those costs or those escalations are predictable, and we are aware of what we will be paying in year one, two, three, all the way to year 10, 15, and 20. And the triple net charges. Are they true? Are they accurate? What are the maintenance costs? Receiving reconciliation statements on an annual basis and having audit rights built into that. Um, how can we protect the practice? Protections, lots of term on the lease agreement. Having a 10-year lease with two five-year options uh, gives us runway for our entire career, but allows us to also transfer the lease to any potential buyer where they have predictability in the space, uh, in addition to uh, the predictability that you have in the space. Um, I, we also do recommend having lots of options in the lease agreement. Um, having multiple five-year options, which we can express as a tenant to ensure that we have predictable time in the space going forward after the original term. The next concept I'd like to discuss is flexibility having an assignment language drafted into the lease agreement, having the ability to transfer, incorporating a death and disability clause in the event something does occur to you, and of course, many of the traps that we do find in lease agreements are risks, such as a relocation provision or a demolition provision. Uh, many, many doctors I speak with are dumbfounded when they identify a relocation provision in their lease agreement. Uh, what essentially a relocation provision entitles it allows the landlord under a 30 or 60 day notice to provide you a letter to say that you will be re relocated to another space in the property. Um, not ideal given the type of business we're in. Um, it's not ideal to have to pick up any of our, our, the work that we've invested into the space and move it to another center within the facility. But it also could put us in a situation where we have great visibility and once we get relocated, we get moved to a third party or, or a lesser desirable location in the same facility. Um, ideally, we, we strike out the relocation provision 
in some cases when we're dealing with large institutional landlords that are in a large retail center with many tenants, um, they would include a relocation pr provision in the event a big box distributor, you know, such as a Walmart or a, one of the Safeway grocery stores or a Metro grocery store is looking to take over your space, they include these relocation provisions in the lease agreement for the betterment of, of those big box retailers. In, in a circumstance like that, where it's very difficult to get a relocation provision struck out of the lease agreement, it is recommended to include in the lease ample notice as well as a landlord contribution to a build-out in the event we ha do have to transfer spaces. Uh, demolition provisions, you know, we're seeing this a lot more in the greater Toronto area, many parts of Calgary, uh, Vancouver, as well as parts of Montreal, typically found in many of the metropolitan cities. And what, what the redevelopment clause or demolition clause means is under a certain period of time, the landlord can notify you that they're looking to redevelop or demolish the building and your tenancy becomes terminated. Um, not ideal position to be in. Of course, it does take time to relocate and identify a new location. Uh, the last thing that we ever want to do or, or be held to is a relocation expressed by the landlord and re really our, our tenancy in the space becomes at risk and we're in a position where the practice might be on downtime. Um, ideally, as we remove that demolition provision from the lease agreement, uh, but if the landlord's unwilling to do that, in some parts of Toronto and Vancouver, we do see that because they do believe that they can redevelop the, the property and sell it to a developer who would build a, a beautiful retail center um, out of their, their older space. In cases like that, ample notice is critical. Um, getting notified by the landlord uh, on the minimum six months ideally one year prior to them expressing their redevelopment right, where we have the ability to go back into the market to express interest in relocating the business. So the first provision I'd like you all to discuss is the option to renew provision. Um, for those of you that are in attendance today, I would recommend spending a few minutes now going over the options to renew provision. And if you can identify any of these risks, uh, I will go through it in a few minutes. But uh, if there's anything that you can pick up off the surface, um, please do take note of that. So again, this type of option to renew language is found in 90% of the office lease agreements that we review. The first item of contention is actually found in sentence one of this option to renew language. It says, it's written as, provided that Dr. Joe Black shall remain as a tenant. The first error there for us as a tenant is that that option is personal to Dr. Joe Black. Provided that Dr. Joe Black shall remain tenant. So only Joe Black is able, Dr. Joe Black is able to express this option. So when we look to sell the business, any potential buyer of our business will not be able to express these options on the then given lease agreement based on how the language is structured in this option to review provision. What we'd like to see in this type of language is that the tenant can transfer the lease agreement, not just the individual doctor who's listed as tenant on the lease agreement. Uh, very important when we look to assign lease agreement that this option is transferable and whoever the tenant is who has acquired our business also has the right to express this option. The second item I'd like to discuss here is that is, is found in the first sentence as well and it says, and if the tenant duly and has regularly paid rent and has performed and has not been in default, it shall have the option to renew this lease for a further term of five years, expressed by written notice to the landlord no less than nine months prior to the end of the term. Um, one thing I always recommend my doctors being aware of are the critical dates in their lease agreement. Not only when their lease is set to expire, but when the option to renew deadline is. And in most cases, we see the option to renew 
anywhere before six months to 12 months, and in some cases, 18 months prior to the expiration. What that means is we do need to express our option or our desirability to stay in this location nine months prior to the lease, ex to the lease expiring. Um, we, we certainly want to ensure that we do have the ability to express these options and that our tenancy doesn't become at risk if, for example, we get past that option to renew deadline. Uh, very important and to be aware and cognizant about these critical dates because they will have an impact on our leverage stance when we do negotiate a lease agreement. Um, the, the other issue that I identified in this lease agreement is any such renewal shall be on the landlord's then current standard form lease at a minimum rent to be determined between landlord and tenant, but in no event shall it be less than the rent paid in the last year of the original term. So two issues there. Number one is it says in the option that any renewal shall be on the then current standard form lease agreement. Now that lease agreement is not a document that has been negotiated. It would be on whatever the landlord has provided at that given time. So for example, at the initial negotiation, we were able to negotiate out the demolition provision or the relocation provision. This option to renew essentially allows the landlord to present any document in front of us if we express our desire to renew the lease. Um, not ideal because it can incorporate some of these critical and risky provisions in that option to renew. But based on how this language is structured in this option to renew, it, it does ensure that the landlord can put any document in front of us. Uh, typically, what we look to structure an option to renew is to only discuss what the economics of the deal will look like going forward, what the base rental rates are, and what the additional costs. Everything else should carry forward from the current lease that has been negotiated with favorable terms for both parties, landlord and tenant. The other item of merit is the fact that in no event shall the rent ever go down. The, the concern with this is, for example, back in 2008 at the height of the real estate market and the economy, we had many doctors sign an in at the tail end in 2017 when property valuations were very high. Over the course of the last eight or nine years, we've seen the value of many of these properties significantly reduced. Now, what, what, how this relates to the option to renew is if the economy, for example, goes down and we do see a market crash where rent rates are now on the market much lower, we should be paying rent based on fair market conditions at that then given time. We should not be obligated to pay rent on an increase when the market is dictating a, a decrease. So certainly a, a, a great way to ensure that our cash flow going forward and our overhead costs are, are fair and reasonable is to ensure that the lease agreement not only you know, has recourse for us in the event that the market goes down. So again, the option to renew, it needs to be transferable, uh, assignable, and that we can pass it on to another doctor in the event they want to renew the lease agreement. Uh, we want to ensure that the lease is structured based on the current standard form lease that we have negotiated, as well as rent rates can be flexible, not just going up. Um, the, the next provision in the lease agreement, and I would argue to say that this is the most important provision in any office lease agreement. It essentially is the assignment language structures the process and how it unfolds when we identify a potential buyer of our business and what it will look like when they look to acquire not only our business, but acquire our lease space. Um, this type of language is found in 75% in office lease agreements, and I'll give you guys all a minute just to review that. And if you have any potential questions regarding that, I can certainly address them following the seminar. Um, but do note them down um, just so that I can clarify them for you. So 
again, in the assignment language, the first item of merit, so typically how the process unfolds is we identify a potential buyer of our business. We determine a purchase sale of price. And that purchase and sale is contingent on the transfer of the lease. In this circumstance, and in most circumstances in commercial real estate, we need to go to the landlord and request consent in order to facilitate a transfer. The issue is it's quite arbitrary in nature whether the landlord can withhold or deny consent. Um, what I'd like to see is language to the effect of landlord cannot deny consent so long as conditions are met. As long as it's a licensed dentist in your province or your state, uh, as long as the doctor is of good class character, has not had any issues with bankruptcy or insolvency, and as long as the banks are willing to finance the acquisition of your business for the buyer, then the landlord should not have any grounds where they can deny consent. Um, quite often we see landlords levy this type of language to derive some profit of, from the transfer of the business. So what I mean by that is if we determine a, pi a practice purchase and sale price of let's say $100,000, in some cases the landlord will levy this consent provision to drive some of that practice sale into their pockets. So if we sold the practice for $100,000 and the landlord says, I will provide you consent as long as you give me 20% of what you sell the business for. Uh, immediately, that's $20,000 taken out of our savings for a practice that we already built. Uh, landlords attribute this to the fact that they believe that the valuation of your business does have a factor on their property and where the property is located, how their property is structured, and that is why you're receiving the value you're receiving. Um, not a big fan of that type of line of thinking. What I'd like to see is that there's grounds built into the lease as to why the landlord has to provide consent. Now, the first con concession or issue or item of merit that I de define in the lease agreement is that the lease, if, for example, we identify a buyer, the first thing we need to do, according to the assignment language drafted here, is approach the landlord and obtain consent from them. We first need to ask them permission to transfer the lease agreement. Based on how this lease agreement is structured in the assignment language, it does state in here that the landlord shall have the option to either terminate the lease or revise the minimum rent to be paid during the remainder of the term of the then greater market rental rate of the lease premises or 15% greater than the current rent. So not ideal position to be in. Um, the landlord does have the control to immediately terminate the lease agreement, which will completely hinder our value of our business. Or they also have the ability to increase rental rates by 15% as long as we ask requests from the landlord to an assignment or transfer of the lease. Um, that, that certainly has an impact on the lucrative nature of your business um, and, and enticing a potential buyer of your business when they are aware that the last year prior to them acquiring the business, that their rental rate, your rental rates were significantly lower. Um, it simply should state in the lease agreement that the landlord simply has to notify us within a 15 day whether they're providing consent or denying consent and whether that consent is based on what factors. Uh, in most cases, it's, it should be very difficult for the landlord to deny consent because we are providing them with a, a great tenant for another prospective position. The last item of merit, and this particularly impacts doctors that are in the transition phase of their career, it is a, a, a notion that when we go through a transfer of the lease agreement, that we as a tenant will no longer remain as tenant. However, we are still obligated to fulfill the duties of the then current tenant. So for example, you know, we, we run our business, we're in the last couple of years of our career, we find a buyer, they acquire the business and have a new 10-year lease where we're a partial guarantor. What this provision is stating is in the event of dispute between the new doctor who acquired your business and the landlord, 
if the landlord was unable to recuperate damages directly from the, set, the buying dentist, then in that case, the landlord has full recourse to come after you, the seller. In all cases, we look to completely remove that ongoing liability upon transfer of the lease. But if the landlord is unwilling to do that, then in that circumstance, we would limit it, the, the, the liability to a set period of time or a set value, either to one year's rent or two to three years following the assignment of the lease agreement. I'm not a big fan of seeing this ongoing liability run in perpetuity with the lease agreement. It's better we have a, a determined cutoff time as to when our, our liability remains with the practice. Now the next language found in lease agreements is referred to as the landlord's right to relocate the premises. Um, this is found in 50% of lease agreements and as I mentioned earlier, uh, very often found in metropolitan lease agreements, you know, the Vancouver, Toronto, Mississauga, um, where, where landlords want to ensure that they have the flexibility to redevelop the property or relocate you within the premises. It provides them greater flexibility to relocate you in any premises or part of the center that they operate in. Um, so what it essentially says in this relocation, and I'll read it out loud for you guys in the interest of time, is to the extent the required in landlord's reasonable judgment to accommodate any an expansion or reconfiguration of the center or an expansion of a major occupier. So one of those big retail centers, you know, Walmart, uh, a Best Buy, Landlords shall have the right to relocate the premises to another part of the center in accordance with the following criteria. The new premises shall be substantially the same size. Now, what does substantially mean? Does that mean it will be bigger? Does that mean it will be smaller? In the event that it is a bigger space, it means that we are committing to a greater base rental rate because we will be taking more square footage. In the event that it is a, to a smaller space, that can have a hinder on our production level. If we have one less office or, or op room that we can do our business out of, given the size of constraints, it can certainly have an impact on our, on our ability to produce at the levels that we were prior to any relocation. Landlords love having this type of flexibility. Um, it, it's understandable in some cases, but in the event that we are obligated to fulfill any relocation duty, we should have recourse and rights as a tenant. Number one being there should be ample notice that we are being relocated. The landlord should be paying for the entire process, not only for our letterhead, our website, and any marketing communications, but also for the physical move of picking up any tables, chairs, computers, x-ray machines, um, you know, Items that are found in most, that, uh, most healthcare practices should be picked up and moved by the landlord and they should facilitate a transfer. The last thing we ever want to see is a relocation occur and there is a, a, a gap between when the new practice is ready and when we're expected to be out of the space. In a case like that, it certainly has an impact on our patient flow because any time that the practice is closed, it loses us patients. So if the event that we do have to relocate from a different space, from our space to a different space in the center, then number one, we need ample time and notice. We want to ensure that the landlord covers all the costs of the move and that when the new space is completely ready, at that point we can move over seamlessly and switch on the lights on the new location. So again, if you look at item B, it says physical relocation of the premises shall be accomplished by the landlord at landlord's cost. But item C says all incidental costs incurred by tenant as a result of relocation, including without limitation, costs incurred in changing address or stationing business cards, directories, advertising, and other such items shall be paid by landlord in a sum not to exceed $1,000. Who here thinks, by raise of hands, who here thinks that we're able to relocate the business at a very low cost 
and that that cost will be less than $1,000. Very rare that that will ever occur. More than likely, the landlord should be covering the cost of that entire move. And if they are relocating us in the center, then it's completely reasonable for us to request that, given the nature of our business. So, there, so we covered three very important provisions in our, in our office lease agreement. Um, but of course, there are other various components that are involved in a transfer of a lease, um, you know, such as assignment, demolition, relocation, death and disability, insurance, surrender, damage and destruction, uh, personal guarantees. These are items that we look to address when we review a lease agreement and provide recommendations on the next course of action. Now, given the change in how a practice is evaluated and the lucrative nature of having a, a full practice in the province of Ontario, given that the governments have put a limitation on the amount of foes that can enter into the market and have almost completely restricken or stricken flow of new FHO practices. Um, so in, in cases like this, when a potential buyer or a younger, de younger doctor is looking to acquire a pre-existing practice, having a full practice is ideal. Um, in, in a case like that, an, an associate would like to receive patient charts right off the onset, which there are, is value that is able to be derived by us as a practitioner. Um, so very important that we're able to transition and, and take our name off the tenancy list when we decide to exit from, den from healthcare and move into a, a, a different position or career in life. Um, one thing that I do want to make sure all of you are aware of is the important nature of having time on our side. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, very important that we do have a, a ample amount of time on the lease agreement in terms of years, predictable years on the lease agreement, but we also include and are aware of our various critical dates. When does our lease expire? When is our option to renew? One of the first recommendations we make for, to all of our clients, whether they're an existing client or a prospective client, is to ensure that you begin the process at least two years from when the lease is set to expire. Um, having two years of, of term on the lease agreement does provide us with predictability. Um, it does provide us with negotiation leverage because we're getting the process started very early. In most cases, landlords want to secure their tenants for as long as possible. And one thing that we can do as a, as a tenant is be aware of when these dates are so that we can be ahead of it uh, and negotiate a better deal, whether that's financially or legally. Um, as we get closer to the expiration date, our leverage stance with the landlord significantly reduces because they're aware that you're in a situation now, once you get close to that deadline, that will be very difficult to relocate the business. And in that regard, they can pass on to you a take it or leave it deal, which is not ideal. So please be aware, start the process early begin the process two years before expiration. Um, from a leverage standpoint, it's the best time to begin the renegotiation. Now, one thing that I would like to speak with all of you is process is key. Um, you know, one thing that we've developed over our 23, almost 24 years of being in business advising doctors when it comes to this critical part of their business is to ensure that a process is followed. And part of our serious process has really ensure that we've had great success with many of our clients um, because we are or have a full picture or idea of what our, our goals, our objectives are going forward. Um, so the first step that we ever want to do is gather all documentation. What that means is we gather all lease documents, original lease agreements, um, any assignment language that's, or assignment language that's found in the lease, any amendments or extensions we gather and consolidate all that document. Um, then we would go ahead and review that office lease agreement after identifying what your career goals are, what you're looking to achieve, what your transition plan looks like. And then at that point, we would begin to review the lease agreement, uh, provide you recommendations, um, provide is issues and areas of concern, what needs to be removed from the lease agreement, 
um, so on and so forth, but very important that we continue to follow this process um, as we move forward. The next step would be to prepare with market rental rate data. So arm ourselves with, with rent rates, comps, and essentially an understanding of what the going rental rates are on the market so that when we pre pre present to the landlord our, our option to renew proposal that is based on his then current conditions um, of the marketplace. The next step in the process is really to develop a strategy. So sitting with the doctors, developing a strategy, uh, determining what outcomes that we're looking to achieve, how, we can, how can we achieve those outcomes, um, and how we can mitigate our risk and liability as under the lease agreement, and presenting that to the landlord, and being very straightforward and thorough with the landlord, saying that we have a very valuable tenant here who's, who's looking to stay in his location, but at the same time may identify a, a, a another space in the event that you're unreasonable with the negotiations, whether it's economic or legal. The one thing that we haven't done so far in this process is pick up the phone and call the landlord. Preparation is key. It's very important that we are armed and equipped with all the tools to have a successful negotiation. So again, following all the processes prior to picking up the phone, ensuring that we have all the documents, they've been reviewed, we've done a market rent analysis, so we know exactly the position we want to be in, but we're also aware of the position we're currently in, so that we can start to build building blocks towards getting to that ideal position. The first step that we look to achieve when we get involved with the landlord is to negotiate the economics of the deal. What are we paying in rent? How much square footage do we have? What do, does the escalations look like year over year? And for a new build-out, what are the inducement allowances? So is the landlord going to contribute to any build-outs? Or is the landlord uh, going to provide us an additional TI for cosmetic work or for paint? What are the rent rates? And what can the landlord contribute? Uh, typically, we, we hammer that out and determine a deal before we move on to the lease agreement. Now, now that we still, now that we've researched and completely reviewed the lease agreement, we would go through a red line of the various items of concern, and go back and forth with the landlord when it comes to when it comes to negotiating uh, the lease agreement. Uh, we want to ensure that we do structure and correct any of the issues and provide amendments to any of the lease agreement um, to ensure that your liability and risks are, are minimized and then you're not exposed via the lease. Now, one thing that very often gets overlooked is when it comes to signing the document. Prior to signing the finalized lease agreement, it is recommended to review the consistency between what has been negotiated over the last two, three, four months when we went through that process and what's actually in the new document. Um, it, it, it's, you wouldn't believe how many times when I spoke with doctors that they're presented with a different document with terms that have been negotiated out throughout the negotiation process. However, they provided them this new lease and unbeknownst to the doctor, they end up signing it even though it's not in line with what was negotiated. So critical that we understand the consistency between the two documents. Um, very important, important for us because we are committing for a long term here and it's, it's not something that we're signing up for a short term run. Well, you know, we typically invest into that community and become a service provider in that community. So very important that we have a, a well-structured lease agreement that protects our interests, um, that's consistent with what's been negotiated, um, and very critical from a transfer perspective as well, that the language in the lease agreement is, is well-structured to facilitate an ultimate transfer of the lease. So, if you, there, there's various doctors that we work with, whether you're an expansion project, uh, you're starting up a practice, you're looking to renew the lease agreement, or you're eventually looking to transition. Um, the lease agreement does have broad implications on all those areas. Um, for a startup practice, one of the keys here are we need to ensure that we have lots of term on the lease, that we have options that are transferable on the lease agreement, uh, we have a death and disability clause, but we also have cost controls in place, such as that right to audit, so receiving that reconciliation statement on an annual basis and then being able to audit that statement. 
for renewals, very important that we begin to have a discussion about phasing out any personal guarantees. Uh, we'd also want to include getting more renewal options, um, having associates come in and having rights as an associate. On expansions and relocations, again, personal guarantees are critical that we negotiate that out. Uh, we do want to sign the lease agreement through our corporate entity, have that veil of protection in place. We want to ensure that there's ample term on the lease agreement and multiple options. That we begin to have discussion about the transition plan and what that flexibility will look like. And then, of course, a death and disability provision um, just to protect your, your family as well as your estate. Now, for doctors that are looking to transition out of dentist, out of the healthcare and are looking to ultimately sell their business, very important that they have the flexibility to do so, which would be written into the lease agreement. We also want to ensure that uh, upon exiting from, dent from, from healthcare, that they no longer have that ongoing liability. That once the lease is sold and assigned to another doctor, they assume all rights and obligations of the lease agreement and we don't have to be worried about trying to fulfill any duties of another tenant. So some of the key takeaways today is the lease agreement can cost you hundreds and thousands of dollars if not properly structured. Um, let's ensure that we structure the lease agreement appropriately from the onset. Uh, very difficult for, the, for very, very difficult for um, a, a doctor to relocate the practice and move the practice um, you know, we want to ensure that the doctor stays and has predictability in their space. Um, also, very key is that it's not just about our rent. You know, rents do have an impact on our overhead and what the costs are associated with the business. But there's also broad legal provisions that do have an impact on your tenancy. And if not appropriately addressed, can have some impact on the value of the business. We want to minimize your risk, maximize your flexibility, um, increase practice valuation, ensure that the lease is consistent with the pr previous lease agreements, but we also want to ensure that we get peace of mind. You know, once the lease is signed and, and executed, that we're not worrying about certain provisions of the lease because we've addressed them throughout the negotiation process. Very important, let's be strategic. Ask the right questions. Uh, when we get involved in projects, many of the times, we're just simply asking questions doing our due diligence, ensuring that the landlord is being honest in their responses, um, finding, out, finding out what their intentions are to do with her current space, but then also identifying and, and getting involved on the new location. Start the process early, guys. Key takeaway from today, 24 months prior to expiration is when we need to begin the process. Do research, ensure that the property is um, you know, you have an idea of what the going rental rates are, what the conditions of the property. Um, if you're in a startup practice before you do anything, make sure you get an inspection done, get a, a group like Henry Shine in the practice, and they can evaluate what, what a build-out will look like, or if we need to get a contract involved, what, what that contractor build-out will look like. Um, so, so key, key, key there that we begin the process very early. Um, so I, I hope today's lecture was very, very helpful for, for many of you, that whether you're looking to start a practice, relocate the business, transfer the lease. Um, my name is Jaz Banga. My contact information can be found here. Part of today's program was, was, part of today's program was sponsored by a, 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 one of our partners who has provided all of our doctors with a complimentary lease voucher so if we did want to take advantage of the lease review, I can certainly review the lease agreement on your behalf to ensure that you're in a, in a, in a well-positioned spot and that you're not overpaying in rent and you're aware of the exact legal obligations. Um, so you're more than welcome to email me to set up the conversation. Um, and, and I'm glad that we were able to touch base today. Uh, it was a pleasure speaking with all of you. And uh, I, I hope you enjoyed the insight when it came to the negotiation of the lease agreement. Uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to speaking with all of you. Thank you. participant has left the conference. Jazz Vanga.